guys, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guest uh, lost a large amount of his vision due to a rare genetic disorder while he was in the midst of a, his career as a filmmaker. Now, Rodney Evans is not just telling his story as a visually impaired visual artist, but others as well in his beautiful new documentary, Vision Portraits. Let's take a look. I think I always make films about the things that are the scariest for me to deal with. If I go like this, I don't see my fingers until there, and there, and then there. I went to this ophthalmologist, and they basically were like, you have this very rare eye condition. You gradually get more and more blind. I feel like I'm just looking for guidance in how to be a blind artist. I remember waking up one morning, getting around the city. I really couldn't read subway stops. Obviously, I was really uh, terrified. When you first enter the idea that you're going to lose your sight, it feels like a terminal point, you know, that you're going to go to this place called blindness, and that's where you stay. But there is something on the other side. It's a different point of view. You know, I came out of the hospital. My mother said, oh, sweetheart, we were so proud of your career. And I thought, what? What makes you think I'm not going to take pictures anymore? I think of it as uh, a restriction on my freedom. It can be enraging. But I do think that there are potential breakthroughs on the horizon. I am cautiously optimistic. Imagine a world of beauty. There's no litter. People don't look tired. Everybody looks the same as they always looked. How can I use my art form as a way of sharing what it is that I'm experiencing? Sometimes it's about the idea and about the imagination and how those things get put together to form vision. Everybody, please put your hands together for writer-director Rodney Evans. <laughs> Rodney, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Congratulations on this on this absolutely beautiful documentary. And to be honest with you, it's my favorite kind of documentary in the sense that it is not just talking heads. It is not just ex telling an idea. It is actually exploring the visual medium. And it is taking documentary to a sort of different, more interesting uh, place than I think most docs we see try to do. Thank you. That was really my goal. So that's, that's nice to hear that that was achieved. Well, you are not typically a documentary filmmaker, right? Well, I am. I'm mostly known for fiction films, but I do, I have, I started out in documentary when, when I was in film school and I did short docs and experimental films. But um, I, I'm mostly known for a film called Brother, Brother to Brother that was Anthony Mackie's first film and also my first film. So we sort of lost our film virginity together. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so I spent like the past 15 years doing mostly fiction stuff. So, and, and then in the past five years, I've been working on this. So I moved back into documentary. So what was it like returning to documentary for you? I think it, you, it was really refreshing, you know, with a lot of fiction films, you have to wait for a lot of agencies to give their clients your scripts if you're trying to get like a name actor or you know someone involved in order to generate the financing. With this, I could just call up a former student who I was still connected to, be like, hey, Mark, can you meet me at John, the photographer's house? on Wednesday at 11.30. You, can you get the GH5 from Dave and the GH4 from Shaheen? And then um, we'll get the recorder and we'll maybe put a radio lav on them and we'll go, it's, it's at 12 noon, let's start. You wanna go, you go? You're giving me flashbacks to my art school days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Getting phone calls from my professors being like, hey, will you shoot this thing for me? <laughs> will you help me out? Yeah. But I did get him a pretty fabulous lead actress for his short film, so I feel like the the it was a nice trade off, you know. Um, now the way that the documentary is told is you are a through line throughout the whole, throughout the whole movie, and there's um, three other art visual art, or artists as well, right? Yes. There's a, a photographer, a dancer, and a and a writer. But you and you were just telling me this in the green room. You initially didn't want to make yourself part of the story. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I thought that I would probably be a framing device, you know, like talking about this g genetic eye condition that I had that um, resulted in the loss of my peripheral vision and leaving me with minimal night vision and, and, and discussed really why I was searching for these specific kinds of artists and wanting to talk to artists who were either working with uh, severely um, low vision or were completely blind and what their process was like and what I could learn from it. So I did have that idea of like putting that up front, but I didn't, I didn't know that I would be a kind of recurring character that we kept coming back to. You've talked about, and you talk about it in the film, a certain, um uh, a fear that you had of sort of coming out as visually impaired for some time, specifically because you were a filmmaker, you thought that it would hamper your ability to get opportunities as a filmmaker. Yeah. Um, do you think that any of that played into how much you were going to put yourself in the film as well, that there is still a part of you who is somewhat scared about being as upfront as possible? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the film, I think Vision Portraits really made me be brutally honest about those fears and overcome those fears and that that idea of myself you know on a 50 foot screen with a red and white cane as a character like if you're going to out yourself as visually impaired like that's a way to do it right like people people are going to know they're going to see you and so you know i do feel like there are stigmas and stereotypes about what disabled artists are able to do. And, you know, I, I don't think that people in the industry would nece necessarily come right out and say, we're not going to hire you because you're visually impaired. But I do think that, that that can become part of the equation when there are a lot of other people vying for that directing gig, you know? So I, I have to be real about the realities of the industry as they exist now. That said, as, a, as, as afraid you, you may have been to put yourself on the 50 foot screen with a red and white cane, so much of the film is also about what you and these other artists can do while being visually impaired. So while sort of showing the images of what a, of, of the, the the, the troubles that a visually impaired person has to go through in day in and day out, you also mostly focus on the successes that a person could have. Yeah, yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, I think that, that these artists are boundary pushing, they're radical, they're transformative, they're using their art to heal themselves and share their experiences with audiences that may not be familiar with what a visually impaired or low vision artist goes through. So a lot of their work is about, you know, putting the the viewer or the audience in the subjective position that they have in order to see the world from their perspective. So I thought that that was important to acknowledge that that was like a focal point of, of each person's work and how they did it was different. You know, sometimes it was on stage with forcing the audience members, in the case of Kayla, the dancer, or forcing the audience members to wear an eye patch because she can only see through one eye. I mean, that would be one example of how she's forcing an audience to look at her work from her specific perspective. Um, so yeah, I think all of the artists were kind of, were grappling with how to do that. What did you think about one of the artists that you that you speak with, uh, the photographer? Excuse me for forgetting his name while yeah. we're sitting here. Uh, no, it's John Dugdale. John Dugdale yeah. talks about how he has no interest in being able to see again. He thinks that he would throw up if he was able to see because the world has changed so much yeah. since he went blind in 1994. Yet at one point in the film, we're also watching you sort of explore new technologies to possibly regain some of your sight. Yeah. What is it what was it like for you to talk to him and hear him say that he has no interest in being able to see again? It was really interesting and and very different from um from how I think about blindness. So just just the fact that we could be two artists dealing with visual impairment but come from very different perspectives obviously he's very on a in a very different place in terms of his the progression of his of his uh blindness right so he's fully blind and has found a certain freedom in that right and his friend said you know once he, he said to him i can't wait for you to lose that last piece of your vision because you're just holding on to that so tightly yeah. and once it goes you're just gonna feel free 
And, and so John really was freaked out by that, but then I think it really did free him up to, to start using his imagination and his memories and his, his knowledge of art history to really, um, to, to really create work and not focus so much on the end product, but focus on how he could work with collaborators and assistants and, and achieve what he was trying to achieve, where I still have 20% of my central vision left. So I have a lot of functional vision left. And I think there are just a lot of uh, medical breakthroughs that have happened between the mid 90s and 2019. So maybe I'm a little bit more hopeful that those breakthroughs might manifest themselves in you know positive solutions to some of these conditions. Did you find that going after this story, telling the story of of, of your vision and your ability as a visual artist, freed you up in some ways as a as a filmmaker? I think it did. You know, it freed me up in in the sense that I was putting the audience in the subjective position of you know, each individual artist that's portrayed in the film, and in some cases in my subjective position. So using mats to kind of block out the periphery, to make the periphery black so that you just see the center of the frame, or shooting through prisms of light um, and refracted light, using macro lenses, not being able to decipher letters on the page. It made me, you know, push the boundaries of cinematic language in order to tell their stories and and make people understand how they saw the world. So if John describes, or rather Ryan describes, struggling to see a poem on stage and, and, and literally like faking it, that he can see it in front of an audience, but the words just becoming like, completely jumbled and and like undis- indecipherable how do i translate that in a visual way so the audience can kind of feel what he's feeling and see what he's seeing in that moment now i'm i'm going to ask i i know the answer to this question but i i'm going to ask for the sake of the audience or uh-huh. people viewing uh, when it comes to what you see on screen and what you get to edit you how does that how does that work for you um, so I see basically, I describe it as a horse with blinders right, or, um, or just tunnel vision really, but it's also kind of, um, I don't see below my chin or above my head, right? So it really is kind of blocked off in that kind of way. Um, but in terms of the filmmaking, you know, I work really closely with a cinematographer and, and we shot list and storyboard everything together and talk about like what the central meaning of each scene is and how it fits to, into the larger um, point of the film and what the larger themes of the film film are and, and how each film, each scene can contribute to that. So we're designing the visual language as we're going in the case of fiction. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I always have a monitor where I can see the entire frame on set. And then with the, with, you know, in terms of working with actors and working with, um, you know, uh, documentary characters that I'm interviewing, it actually really helps me to just block out all the equipment and stuff that has nothing really to do with my job anyway. My my job is to focus on, you know, eliciting either performance or engaging in a deep conversation and, and going wherever that conversation takes us. So it helps me to do my job better, actually, I think, um, ironically. John talks about still, even though he's, 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 he's fully blind, f- having a sort of rich uh, visual tapestry that he can kind of tap into all the time when it comes to taking photographs. Yeah. He can visualize everything and he can talk about it very articulately uh, when he's giving direction. Do yeah. you feel, I know that you, are, you teach cinema, you have a persona poster uh, in your house, so clearly you yeah. love... Uh, you love cinema and have a, 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 you know, I'm sure a wealth of knowledge about it. Do you tap into that and use that a lot when it comes to working with your crew? I do. You know, I mean, it depends. I think sometimes it's in- intuitive. Sometimes you don't quite know that a lot of the things that you've seen are being drawn on as you're designing shots and as you're thinking about the visual language of, of the film. But You know, I've also just gone to art school and seen a lot of, 
you know, diary films that were made in the 40s and 50s by, you know, more experimental filmmakers. So I'm, you know, really versed in that language and that that history. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's just in me, you know. So I, I don't think I specifically go out of my way to say, like, you know, oh, the way that Boonwell or David Lynch did this shot in this film, like, I want to mirror that in some way. But there is, you know, something about, you know, certain filmmakers that have, like, deeply inspired me that I think are in my DNA as a filmmaker, for sure. So literally just like any other filmmaker in a lot of ways, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just, I, I appreciate the history of cinema, and, and, I've, and I've just, and I'm like a cinema, cinephile. I go to movies, like, all the time. I see, like, six movies a week. It's... It's impossible to, for that not to influence you as a filmmaker, I think. See six movies a week? Probably. Jealous. I, I mean, they probably see six movies a week, too, but those are six movies of your choosing. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm not tortured by the films that I, <laughs> that I see. <laughs> Um, you know, you talk about those, these sort of diary films, uh, avant-garde diary films of the 50s and 60s, yeah. and now that you mention it, you can kind of see that influence on this a little bit in the way that you, in these sort of visual sections of the movie, these sort of more lyrical sections that yeah. punctuate the story of how, when someone went blind or when someone lost a certain part of their vision. When did you first come up with that idea that you could sort of have these sequences throughout this? Um, I think that happened mostly in the edit room, um, or you know, or I knew that those sections would be there. I think the content of those sections became finessed in the editing room and with my co-editor Hannah Buck, who also has an art history background. But it was helpful to have an objective. I, you know, in the edit room, who could actually say like, "No, Rodney, I think you're you're." the main character who's changing over the course of the film, who we keep coming back to. The other people have their segment and then we're, just, we're with them and then, then we come back to you. So like, how are you changing throughout this film? Did that force you to have to then go shoot more with yourself? Like, did you come into the edit room with just the portraits of these, of these three artists? Yeah, and I had some stuff with myself and I did know that um, that I you know was going to be in these interstitial moments, but I have to say there were the the hardest things for me to cut myself, mm -hmm. and so the way that we worked was that I did the first assembly, and I think I I edited everyone else's section really really closely, and then I just kind of threw together some images of me and just was like, I think it's going to go something like that. <laughs> and she was like, really? Like pure fear of yourself yeah. in a lot of ways. Yeah. She's like, whoa, here, exactly. just take this. I think I'm going to be looking at the solar eclipse outside. I, I, there's some footage that looks like, I, I just sketched it out a little for you. She's like, I think we can work on that section a little bit. <laughs> what was your first thought when she told you that? Did you, know, you resist or I didn't resist. I was open to it because I knew I knew that it was true. And then Do you think there was a part of you that knew even before she said that? Yes. Yes. I did know that those sections needed needed a lot of work. And um and that was the you know, we screened it twice just um for friends and filmmakers and editors and just to get feedback, you know. It's just sometimes it's good to just like get fresh eyes on it just to kind of see how it's playing in front of a group or whatever. So, you know, we usually gathered people that we trusted whose opinions, you know, we thought would be good and we asked them to fill out questionnaires. So if there's stuff that there's not, they're not necessarily comfortable voicing, they can write it down, right? And so some, a lot of times people were like, we, everyone else is really, really well fleshed out. Rodney's not. And he, we need to be grounded in his experience and, and that's kind of gonna give us um, a place to really um, move from when we start when we go on the journey of the film and that it feels like it's missing and or or we're just getting too much information too fast. So there's a lot of things about pacing. You can get a lot from just just having people, who haven't been all up in up in the footage every day, you know. But of course, Rodney wasn't the most fleshed out. That's you. Yeah. And it's sort of right. hard to really flesh out yourself, especially sure. when you have, or you had at one point in your life, lots of self doubt. Yeah, 
It, yeah, definitely, a hundred percent. And I would say that that was what was so great about working with Hannah, the co-editor, because then she could take that information and then ask the, the, the right questions in the right way where it, it would be galvanizing. And I'd be like, okay, w- you know, how do I differ from John and how I think about blindness? I'm really afraid of going blind. It's, it's um, in, in some instances, it's kind of enraging that I have to be so careful in a dark space where everyone else gets to be cavalier and go to a bar and have a drink and have fun and and get to see everyone who's cute really clearly. <laughs> you know, like, I can't. I don't, I'm like, I don't know if that person's, person's cute or not. Like, it's dark in here. <laughs> you know, it'd be nice to know. Um, so... You know, so Hannah would just ask these tough questions and I'd be like, no, I differ from John. I'm, I'm completely terrified of going blind and doing everything to maintain my vision. And she'd be like, okay, so let's figure out some questions. I know you don't want to write like a staid voiceover that feels like some corny PBS thing. Like, I feel you. We don't need to do that. Why don't you get Kirsten, who's your good friend, to just ask you these questions on camera and then we'll just pull the voiceover from those conversations. So that's basically what we ended up doing. Um, uh, how old were you when you started to lose your vi- some of your vision? Um, I, was, I would say the symptoms started to manifest themselves when I was 26, and then I was diagnosed when I was 27. So that, at that point, you were already making, making films. Yeah, I'd been making films... I started making films as in in college as an undergrad, and then I went to um, get my MFA. So all during that time, I was making tons of like documentaries and experimental films, and um, and then you know in late 1996, I moved back to New York after I finished grad school, and that's when I sort of noticed that things were really going were just really odd with my vision and, and people would hand me tapes at my job and I wouldn't see them. And, and my boss would be like, are you going to take this tape from me? Right. And I'd be You'd like, be handing it yeah, I'd be like, Oh, uh, uh, Oh yeah. Uh, th- uh, thanks. Or someone would like try, you know, extend their hand to shake my hand at a party and I wouldn't see it. And they'd be like, aren't you going to shake my hand? Uh, and I'd be like, sorry, yeah. I didn't see. Yeah. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Like, you know, what was it like? as a filmmaker to be told that you were losing your vision and how long did it take you to sort of reclaim your abilities or that, that passion for filmmaking or was it pretty quick? Well, you know, the way that they told me, I think was helpful in that it was more of, um, they presented it as two strains of this condition, which is called retinitis pigmentosa. Mm -hmm. And they basically were like, there's one strain where you know you lose your vision really fast. It happens over the course of six to eight years, and after about eight years, you could be you know almost fully blind. It seems like you have this other strain that has progressed to a certain point, but then it seems like it's plateaued and that it's gonna just stay where it's at for a couple decades at least and but you need to monitor it there's certain things that you can do there's certain medications you can take to maintain a certain kind of eye pressure to keep the fluid behind your eyes from not building up all these things that like that do deteriorate your retinas there are things that you can do to prevent it from getting worse so we recommend you go to this retinal specialist you see him every three months you follow his advice and you'll be fine. So I think I took it as, okay, I've got this condition. Uh, They tell me I'm doing everything I can do. Like, I got this other film I'm dying to make. Uh, You know, I'm just gonna make that film and I'm just gonna put all my time and energy into that. Like, why- Wait, it pushed you. Yeah, it was a little bit like, why, why focus your energy on something that you really have no power to do anything about? Did and that take some time to come around to, or is it? No, barely? I think it was pretty quick. I think I think I was, you know, pretty much um, already enveloped in in creating Brother to Brother, which involved a lot of research, 
a lot of um, writing down of like personal experiences. So, you know, that film has deals a lot with this younger gay generation during the Harlem Renaissance. And so I just kind of went down that rabbit hole and started to think about how my experiences related to those experiences. And frankly, it was my first screenplay. So I was figuring out how to write a screenplay <laughs> as I was doing all of this research at the same time. So I don't know. I, I you know, people talk about like, um, the new era of multitasking. And I think I'm a unitasker if such a thing exists where I, I just have one, I have one project and I'm just like, I'm, I, you know, I, I've been called the finisher and that I just, I drill down until something is just done. Like it really bothers me if they're just like dangling threads that need to be um that needed to be completed or whatever so i i tend to just like focus for that amount of time that a project takes and then once it's done i move on to the next thing and vision portraits you said took about five years yeah from from idea to to what you was know, the first, first thing that you shot for it the first thing i shot was um john's section oh, wow. and believe it or not all of that was shot in one day so um, with John, it was interesting. We went to his apartment that first day, and he pretty much um, was really, I think, I think it was emotionally draining because it was such a, it was a painful time for him when he was losing his vision. So John, John had um, an AIDS-related stroke in the early 90s at the height of the AIDS epidemic and and was in St. Vincent's Hospital for a year and a half mm. with all with you know AIDS related symptoms it was touch and go he came pretty close to dying a lot of people died around him so you know i think a lot of john's um work on healing and transformation comes out of that experience and of being part of the gay community and of that desire to connect and to not be afraid to show, you know, gay male bodies together connecting in a way and um, that symbiosis and that upliftment that comes through his photographs, I think is directly related to his experiences. So that being said, I think John, I think it was more emotional doing the interview than he thought it would be. And so when I called him up to set up the second day of shooting, he was like, I'm done. <laughs> I'm not, mm, uh, I think I think you have you have plenty. We we shot in different rooms. I told you some stories. Uh, you know, I, I you we sat on I sat on the bed. There's that great magic hour <laughs> shot that you were so excited about. That's you know the light coming in the room. He's like, I'm done. Yeah, yeah, no. He's so headstrong. I love him. Yeah. <laughs> He, yeah, when once the uh, documentary subject says that to you, 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 it's like, what are you gonna do? Right. Like break in their house and start filming. So when so. you went to shoot him, were you, did you have any semblance of what this piece was gonna end up being, or were you just sort of like, I'm gonna shoot an artist or a photographer who's blind, and and we'll see where it goes from there. Yeah, and it was very much um, so as I cracked my tooth against the microphone. Um, it was very much taking it one step at a time of yeah. just. Um, I'm going to get through this one day of shooting and see what happens with this one person. And, and, I, and I, I had already known Ryan Knighton, so I knew that I could set that up pretty easily after that. So we shot Ryan in Vancouver probably a month later. But yeah, I wasn't quite sure how everything would mesh together. I think that's the beauty of documentary. It's, it's changing as you're shooting it. And it's, you know, you're kind of finding the form um, as it's uh, progressing and as you're editing, you're kind of thinking about what you might still need. And so up until the, the last day of editing, the, the cinematographer was still delivering footage to the cutting room. So like I remember we got the last, um, the last SD card from Kirsten, the cinematographer, and it had this kind of um, subjective 
uh, footage shot through prisms and with macro lenses. And Hannah was like, oh, I'll, I'll take some of that. Let me sprinkle some of that over here. <laughs> and then it was like, okay, I think, I think we're done. Do you think we're locked? Do you, you, you feel good? I was like, I feel good. You want to watch it one more time? We'll watch it one more time. She was like, and then we watched it. We're like, yeah, I think we're locked. We'll, we'll let it sit, see if, you, see if things like come up. That, that you're still thinking about, but like, so it was, it was very, like a very fluid movement between the, the shooting and the editing, and we would talk about what we needed, and because Kirsten and I are such close friends, and we live three blocks away from each other in Flatbush, Kirsten could just like come over with her C100 camera and just interview me, you know, just, you know, pick up my broken award from Sundance and be, and where where I'm like, oh, my award broke. How did it break? It fell off of a shelf. Oh. <laughs> uh, I think we have time for a few questions from the audience. Who has a question right here? Oh, Rodney. Um, Hi. You spoke about working in both documentary filmmaking and fiction filmmaking, and I'm wondering yeah. what your favorite thing about documentary filmmaking is. Maybe something that you can't get from fiction filmmaking. Oh, that's such a great question. You know, I think what I love about documentary is that you can just, you can just start. You can just green light yourself and and pick up a camera and find interesting subjects. And you can, you know, borrow cameras in the case of what I did and buy a couple of SD cards and show up at a, a fascinating subject's house and have him tell you some great stories. And then you've got, you know, an 11 minute section of a movie where I think with fiction a lot of times it's you know it's based on the screenplay so you have to have a lot of um, you spend a lot of time writing a screenplay and and sometimes it's you know a certain actor that people want to guarantee that people are going to go see the movie so with fiction it, I think it takes a, just a lot more time and a lot of things, more things need to align before you can move forward. I like that documentary is just fast and you can just keep it moving and I can do it with like a hundred dollars. Just makes it really um, accessible and easy and I can just put one step in front of the other and kind of figure out what I'm doing or how the story's gonna evolve as I'm shooting. Well, one more. Hi. Hey. Um, as a documentarian, do you have predetermined questions going into every interview with your subjects? And is there anything that you asked that didn't end up in the final product? Oh, yeah. Thank you for that question. It's great. I, I do usually write a list of questions. And just to make sure I've thought everything through and that I've... I've you know, um, done my research in terms of who I'm interviewing and, and know about their background. And, um, you know, that being said, if, if, if the conversation um, digresses from those questions and they go to a more interesting place, like I'll definitely go there for as, as long as it takes. If they, if they find a more interesting angle or if something more interesting comes up, I don't feel beholden just to what I've written down. It's, I think that's the also the beauty of documentary is that you can be free in the moment and, and change course as you're shooting. And so with John, he, he spoke for three and a half hours. You know, I probably had written down 12 questions, but he went all over the place, man. You know, and, and some of it was you know, fantastic and placed things that I just didn't think he was gonna discuss so when that when that happens and those stories are really interesting it's just it's gold you know and so um so yeah you have to make really hard decisions in the edit room or um or torture people with a 10-hour movie <laughs> i don't you know what i mean john's sex own his interview was three and a half hours and and it's 11 minutes in the film so Figuring that out was, you know, that was a, that was a doozy. Just just knowing what was essential to be in that section and what was, you know, kind of interesting, but but maybe not not absolutely necessary. Um, so yeah, it be, you, you got to make tough choices. 
for sure. Uh, Rodney, I love the film. Congratulations on the film. Thank, Thank you so you. much for being here. Vision Thank Portraits you. comes out tomorrow in theaters, right? People yes. can see it? Tomorrow at Metrograph. Tomorrow at Metrograph, which is such maybe one of the best theaters in New York yes, City. Yes, 7 Ludlow Street. We'll be there. <laughs> Q&A's happening all weekend long. Rodney Evans, everybody. Let's hear it. <laughs>